All right, it's now time for the lead that we have promised you all evening. What do you know if your teen son or daughter was involved in crime? Tonight we delve into the underworld of teenage crime in the city, the place of law enforcement in abetting crime, and why it'll take a long time for the police to stem the rising cases of insecurity. We leave you now with Dennis Onsarigo's bullet hole. Every time they are gunned down, the media is called to report on what police present as yet another outstanding case of hard work by Hokkaid police officers. Silent across Nika, scared at Mali, what on a Lipuana Sasa, no, no, there are Kajakulipa Minikans of Toroka, Bangali, and Yuman Kapata Mojetua, Miss Moja, a Manguka China, and Rufa. Sasi to Kansa Kukimbia, Kumbia, and Yumatu, Luka, and Miss Indian at Fatana Bunduki, Aga Kimbia Kakros. The public reaction is often mixed. Oh. On the one hand, the desperate law that wants a quick fix to rising insecurity in the country, but another section of the crowd milling around the steel body shudder at what they see as a case of police taking a shortcut in stemming the tide of insecurity. But the bodies on the road, the estates and villages are those of real people with real names and the crisis is getting bigger by the day. These three suspected gangsters are killed in Nairobi alone every single night. That is 21 suspects killed in a week, 630 every month. And at the end of each year, the number is staggering and scary. The next stop for the lifeless body is the city mortuary. The infamous mug where every unidentified body in the city finds its way. Here the families come face to face with the first nightmare. But just which cave do all those being killed emerge from? Why can't young men and women stop engaging in crime if the ultimate consequence of their action is death? Yasinta Wanjiru has experienced the story of suspected gangsters firsthand. The mother of three says she has been a victim of a ruthless, bloodthirsty police service. Living in a single room in the sprawling Madare slums, Jacinta says hers has been a life of fear and that her son did not have much time to live. Policemen known to Anthony had been hunting him down. <laughs> Duanako, <laughs> Just kilometers away, the 24-year-old was gunned down as he tried to flee across the river. 
Tony became part of the growing statistics of youngsters shot and killed by police officers. The local police had a ready explanation for the gunning down of the young man. They were running away. Uh, they were brandishing a, a pistol. Then uh, the officers did not give up. They pursued them uh, until they caught up with one who was uh, in possession of the gun. Uh, he tried to, uh, to swim or to go within, uh, to, 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 to just uh, go into water, but it was not possible as the officers were just uh, 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 nearby. Lying next to Tony's body is a rusty but common weapon, a pistol which insiders say is routinely planted on numerous crime scenes in the city. Tony joined the list of other young men gunned down by police officers in Nairobi. The Kenya Police Service is designed in a such a way that one crack unit does not necessarily know what the other does. For instance, Ego 1 that is taxed with the cracking down on armed crime in the central business district doesn't necessarily know what the special crime prevention unit does. <laughs> Deep in Madare slums is Shantit, a name that describes the shame that is a slum at the heart of Nairobi County. But it is here that the lead meets a surviving gang member at only 27. The man who belonged to a group of 19 other gangsters just buried his last gang member at Langata Cemetery. Carlos, not his real name, says he has buried more than 20 of his friends. Mkulabaka calling Auda the man King Auda, Kuna Caveman, Kuna Sili, Kuna Eriko, Kuna Ke, Kuna Kevini, Kuna Puya, Kuna Yabingi, Kuna Karash, Kuna Freddy, Dimuri, Moas, Gashogu, Nivingi. All the team, what's up for it? All the team. Okay, Teddy, Ochi, Dimore, Alex, Abja Nixon, Dante, Fadi, Machete Pia. How do police choose who lives and who gets to die? Carlos says after the brother's death, life took a turn for the worse. It is the life of being out in the night to steal and maim and hanging around what Carlos says is the base during the day. I say base, the king. king. Oxen ge apa, you are the king. Saud you are the king. Sa, abom di vi ve ge apa. The base is a deserted and filthy corner where youngsters come to smoke, share their stolen loot before planning their major robbery. At the heart of the slum is another story of shattered dreams. For this young boy, life was all rosy. His older brother would go stealing, bring back the money and support their family. Joroge, ripping from the thrill of crime, joined his brother in the underworld. 
Kwa hivyo sijui ama hiyo kazi kaisha sijaweza fanya nini. Nadharu ni kuiba tena. Bila kazi sinajua kuna otherwise jua kuna mtu anategemea. From petty crime of snatching mobile phones from unsuspecting residents of Madare to highway robberies, Jorogi at only 15 stopped engaging in crime. His older brother was shot and killed by police officers as he watched. His world crumbled. Unable to make ends meet, Jorogi is now working as a Changa seller in the heart of the slum. It is not only those born and brought up in the slums and with little education that are engaging in crime. Those who have gone through formal education too are finding it difficult to find gainful employment and crime appears to be the ready option for many. Approximately 500,000 candidates sit for the Kenya Certificate of Secondary Education examinations each year. Out of that number, 100,000 make it to university. 300,000 others fight for their place in tertiary institutions. Others give up on life. OG not his real name is one lucky candidate. He sat for his all level examinations, joined a prestigious university, passed well, but the job market has evaded him. OG has turned into crime. Actually, it's, uh, 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 there are compliments on my application has been different from the employers. Some are based on uh, tribe, some some even don't explain the reason, they just send you and maybe try to tell them, maybe they'll call you later on. They never call. From major robberies to estate car jackings, OG says education has done little in feeding his family. Yeah, you have a family, your mother is there, father is there, they're all poor. You also have kids to take care of. So you end up getting frustrated and, you know, get involved in this uh, criminal activity in our uh, area here. The lead met OG after a recent robber in Kayole. Someone died in a deadly exchange of fire with police officers. The father of two tells the lead he cheated death. We were told actually with a uh, big guy. We also have a big guy here. Uh, oh, we were actually told by inside man that uh, there was some money with some guy in Kayole. It was a lot of money. So as you know, frustration when you hear money, you always get furious. So uh, we went there and uh, little did you know that uh, the guy was also loaded. He had a gun and the neighbor was a police officer. So we were six of us. Everyone plays, playing his own duty and role. So one of us was actually uh, caught by the guy we went to rob and for us to save him we had to do some killings but by bad luck so our colleagues also died for them many of those who hand down suspected gangsters are themselves part of a network of police officers who work closely with gangsters police are also involved in some of our cr criminal activities they know they know so when you tend to leave or they tend to leave this field here to become the target because they fear you may maybe sell them out. So you become target, they kill you. Yeah. The rogue police officers hire out their guns at a fee, mislead their fellow colleagues when pursuing suspected gangsters, and at times they deliberately take to quote a weak criminal case. I've actually buried around 11 friends of mine. 
some you are really close friends of mine. They are very very close. Oji told the lead it is a tricky place to find yourself in. As a gangster, policemen he says have a license to display their guns and kill, but for gang members, it is a route that is as risky as the thought of it. OG says the most recent robbery saw him lose yet another gang member. The number he says keeps on growing, but he insists he must steal to stay alive. Actually, we are even having a, a burial this Saturday of another colleague who was, who was shot dead. But it is a different story for Anthony Mboro. For him, the world of crime is now a thing of the past. His turning point came when police gunned down an armed young man in his estate. <laughs> The lead got to the scene of the killings minutes after it had happened. Police once again claimed they had stopped gangsters in their tracks. The gangster withdrew a pistol and intended to fire the officer. It's when the officer uh, moved fast and uh, shot at each other one who was sitting at the right back as they were preparing to leave. Then the other two who are still on the same motorcycle disappeared through this road. What is it that is driving young men and women into crime? The easiest answer would be to talk about desperation and say that this younger people are disillusioned they have nothing to do and you know um, they're falling flat on their faces when it comes to employment and school so that's the easy answer but if you look deep down uh, you're looking at a situation where crime is becoming a way of life you know the younger guys are picking it up as if it's an alternative to mainstream and conventional um, activity and that's now the dangerous part because when you go to those parts of the world where somebody can say either go to school do business or run drugs and then you choose one and it looks normal, then you, you are in a very dangerous place. Investigations by the lead suggest that those behind car jackings are young boys and girls aged between 18 and 25. But this group of gangsters look up to older gang members. We have um, what some people are now calling criminal socialization, that they are guys whose business is to train upcoming criminals and they are doing roaring business instead of preventing they're actually cultivating into the minds of the younger people that you could actually do this and earn a living those who carjack and suspecting motorists rarely harm their victims to avoid attracting the attention of the police gangsters believe policemen look the other way if a victim has not been killed or injured in a robbery incident but pursue with vigor gangsters who kill or maim their victims. Crime trends are also changing. University students engage in crime know what those looking for them after a crime has committed go for. They don't drive cheap cars as getaways. They drive expensive vehicles to avoid being flagged down by police officers. Sociologists warn that criminals are no longer just in slum areas. They are in a neighborhood near you. They run a stall in the estate, attend evening classes in universities, and at times even attend church. Where the security agencies almost, almost look like they're giving up. You know, they do their job because they have to do it, but they're almost giving up. Then you have the middle class who think it is not our duty. You know, let me protect what I've got. I, buy, I hire two watchmen, I live in a house with an electric fence and that kind of thing, and to him that's it. So the minute he steps out of his gate, he's complaining about crime, but he's doing nothing about it. And, and so therefore, when, when you engage in structural aloofness, what happens is criminality thrives. Because these guys are saying, okay, fine, the president talks about it, the police, uh, the inspector general talks about it, but there's not much we are seeing them doing. And so the, crime, the criminals begin to feel as if they're beating the system. The worst part is when this structural aloofness comes down to class consciousness. The upper class are like, please do something about it, we'll fund you. The middle class are like, 
what can we do? The lower class, let's take part in it. So there's that class war between these guys and everybody else is saying it is not our duty. Class corruption and all these mega things you see. So the younger guys down here, the lower class are like, okay, if those guys are stealing billions, let me also do with hundreds. A worrying trend is emerging where police officers are taking part in robberies and carjackings. Investigations by the lead indicate that those carjacked in more secure areas in the city are fallen victim to rogue police officers on the beat. It is police officers robbing those they are supposed to protect. Our criminal activities is connected in various uh, ways. We have a lot of inside guys who tell us, you know, we are not angels, so we to know who has the money, who doesn't them have the money. But we communicate with other people to tell us who has this and who and how much is it. So it's always with that inside man. There's always a third party. In Nairobi alone, the number of police officers engaged in armed crime has got security agencies worried. The worst thing for the security apparatus is when the citizenry begins to doubt you. You could be doing a good job, but as long as everybody on the street is saying, I know, then you have a problem. Policemen are giving gangsters leads, sometimes giving them a safe passage by chasing the wind as gangsters from a crime scene escape to safety. Investigative agencies point to an increasingly frustrated population of young men that can't be stopped by the bullet but who keep trying to make a living out of crime. Sociologists warn that crime is moving from slum to well secured residential areas. That you're thinking, okay, fine, they're the family, they're next door, but they have a better car, they have better seats in their house, you know, everything about them looks good. And my parents are here suffering, why can't I do something about it? So then you start engaging in that silent competition, you know, to try and achieve something on their behalf. The killing of youngsters, some on mere suspicion that they engage in crime is hardening those already deeply masked in it. Those who survive the security agency's onslaught live to fight another day. You know, when you talk to these guys, they, they let you know, I went to college. Even the carjackers, you know, they do these things and they talk to you and say, it's just that I couldn't do anything else. That's why I'm here. So half the time, they don't even kill. These guys engage in crime to survive. And that survival must be justified by the fact that the system failed them. So once you get to that point where you're rationalizing crime, and the guy can even quote theories for you and tell you, you know, Sunderland, he said there's this thing of criminal disparities. And if I don't succeed in education, then I succeed in criminality. You can't argue with such a person. And when he dies, he dies a happy man, if you ask me. In most cases, we don't sleep in our places because you, know, you never know who, who will be there. Because we know, we know some officers, police officers, some, uh, uh, some uh, I mean, uh, other gangs who also have beef with you. But when you spend a night, or, I'm going to spend a night in my place, by around four, I'm, I'm up and out. Another day is what drives the young men and women into the dangerous underworld of crime as they try to make ends meet. A world where the most evasive ones survive, but not for long, and where rogue police officers trade their professionalism with crime. Denson Sarigo, the lead. KTN News.